Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to have you with us again for this conference. Um, and this morning we will be starting out um, with a presentation on cost report best practices. Um, and I will turn you over to my colleague, Wade Gallen, and our special guest for today, Blaine McKinney, the Manager of Enterprise Reimbursement for WVU Medicine. Thanks, Hillary. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 2024 Critical Access Hospital Conference. We're excited to talk with you this morning about cost reports, our, one of our favorite subjects here. Just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, we are going to have everybody muted during the presentation, but you can utilize our amazing chat or Q&A feature to ask questions and interact. We'll have a few questions throughout the presentation to kind of, um, you know, jar up some conversation. Uh, all these sessions are, today are going to be recorded and they're going to be available to the registrants following the, the conference. And also, we just want to remind you of a short survey that we're going to have at the end of the conference that will help us um, basically collect feedback for future conferences and help us do better. So we appreciate you being here and, and taking that survey if possible. Again, just a quick look at Stroudwater and, and the clients we serve are a national firm. So we work with critical access hospitals all over the country. And also our sister company, Stroudwater Capital Partners does as well. So we are really seeing, um, even in the context of cost reporting, a good range of really uh, cost report preparation techniques and, and methodologies. And so that'll inform this presentation as well. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into cost reporting best practices. I am Wade Gallen. I'm a senior consultant here at Stroudwater with a focus on financial and operational improvement. A little bit of background on myself. I started off at a local Medicare administrative contractor where I did a lot in the form of auditing and desk reviewing cost reports. And then after that moved into more of a consulting role, helping hospitals and other um, health systems prepare their cost reports, other provider types, and then moved into the provider setting for a while, which is actually where I met Blaine. And we were um, working together at Maine Health, a system located up here in Maine where we currently reside. And um, after that, moved to Stroudwater. So I've been with the firm about three years at this point. And I'll turn it over to Blaine to just give some background about herself as well. Yeah, um, so I'm Blaine McKinney. I'm a manager with uh, Enterprise Reimbursement at WVU Medicine. Um, my system is a 21 facility system with uh, both cause and acute care facilities, PPS and soul community, uh, some nursing homes and long-term care facilities as well. Um, we uh, definitely have a wide breadth of variety um, in my system and I've always been in the provider setting. So I've worked at both WVU Medicine and Maine Health. Um, so I've interacted with a couple different Macs by uh, being in two different systems and uh, excited to help out with this. Fantastic. Yeah, so as we, we jump on in, we're excited to have this um, conversation, really. We, we do want it to be a conversation, so please feel free to ask questions and interact in the chat box. Um, just a high-level overview of our agenda here. We're going to touch base very briefly on call reimbursement. I know a lot of folks on here are familiar with critical access hospital reimbursement, but just a quick overview. Then we're going to jump into some of the cost report best practices. And, you know, Blaine and I were kind of uh, discussing ideas and our experiences and preparing and reviewing cost reports. And we put together a list of, of six items that we felt were really uh, meaningful as you consider cost reporting for a critical access hospital. And then we're going to look at a few reimbursement opportunities that we've um, identified really working with hospitals all across the uh, country and um, looking at their cost reports and seeing some similar trends in, in opportunity areas. So we'll take a look at those as well. Um, again, just a quick overview, critical access hospitals receive cost-based reimbursement for inpatient outpatient services for our Medicare patients. Um, our cost-based reimbursement also impacts our Medicare Advantage payers in the form of rate letters. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And in some states, Medicaid also reimburses critical access hospitals based on their uh, cost or allowable costs as a more technical term. Um, so what cost-based reimbursement does, it, it's a partial insulator for hospitals when they experience significant um, fluctuations in their volumes, uh, and it can provide some advantages um, due to the cost-based reimbursement mechanism for things like capital planning, uh, and helps us operate in communities with inherently low populations. Uh, it's not a, a hedge against every 
risk and it doesn't negate the need for prudent cost management strategies, but it does provide a, a little bit more of a buffer than um, a straight PPS or fee-for-service environment. And really the reason why we bring this up is because the Medicare cost report is crucial for calculating your rates, your cost-based rates. Um, so that's why we are delving into it today. All right, so uh, just to get some interaction, we'd love for folks to engage and, and type in, you know, have you ever prepared a cost report? Um, do you utilize a consultant to prepare your cost report? Have you ever reviewed a cost report? Um, and what's your experience with that? So um, that would be the question here is, you know, how much experience do you have with a cost report? Have you prepared one before? Have you reviewed one before? Do you utilize outside help to prepare your cost report or review your cost report? Folks can type that in the, the Q&A or the chat box. That would be great so we can get a better feel for our um, audience here. And uh, while those while those come in, let's see, we've got some responses. Okay, a lot of consultants uh, preparing the cost report, have reviewed, don't prepare, auditing firm. Yep, okay, use a number of groups. Yep, I see a lot of consultants preparing. Some have prepared cost reports. Um, reimbursement department within our health system. So that's very relevant, Blaine. We, we certainly have experience there. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then some don't prepare their cost reports. So this is a good range of, of folks. So I'm excited to jump into this conversation and feel free to continue to, to type it in the chat as we go through. So here are our six best practices we came up with and we'll just go through those. Um, the first one that we wanna look at here, and this is by no means an all-inclusive list, we haven't uh, exhausted all the best practices for cost report preparation and review, but these are some of the key ones we were we came came to a conclusion on. So expense and revenue mappings, for those who aren't familiar with the, the mechanism of the cost report, basically what it does is it groups your expenses and your revenues into um, cost centers is what they're called. So it'll take all your expenses associated with your lab department or your med surge or inpatient floor, um, you know, your therapies department, it'll map all those into specific cost centers. And it'll do the same thing with our revenues. So the cost will be on worksheet A and the revenue will be on worksheet C. And it uses this to uh, really calculate your cost to charge ratios, um, expenses getting mapped to your inpatient units. They won't have necessarily a cost to charge ratio, but it goes into your per diems and calculating that. So uh, the potential issue that we see here and why we labeled it as a best practice is really that, um, first of all, it's required that you do proper matching. They call it the matching principle, where you um, do your best to map your expenses and your revenues in the same cost center. And this is easier said than done. But one of the ways that, or generally, you know, in my experience, and Blaine will certainly speak to her experience as well, but when we're mapping these expenses and revenues, we utilize things like the trial balance, a revenue detail file, the Medicare um, Provider Statistical and Reimbursement Report, or PSNR for short. And these are really the key inputs. And it's really important to get this right. And I know, Blaine, we were talking about how it's important to get matching right because it can have impacts on your, your actual rates, right? So I know you had a, a story. Yeah, about abs that. absolutely. So um, a lot of the facilities in my system right now are 531 um, deadlines for their cost reports. So we actually just went through this this year where we were kind of struggling with our um, EKG and our respiratory clinic. And we realized that a lot of the EKGs were actually happening in the respiratory clinic. And we didn't have our Medicare PSNR allocated appropriately for that. So they were still going to the EKG line for the majority of that. And we needed to make a change where we actually moved about $400,000 of the PSNR allocation into the respiratory clinic line. And that better aligned with what was happening in the business um, and where those services were actually being provided. So by doing that, we flipped our settlement figures from a liability to a receivable. So there are very um, real world practices where you have to understand what's happening in your business and just diving into it we just kind of started looking at why is the cost to charge ratio look a little bit high and out of whack and one of the lines low in the other um, what's happening here and we had some conversations with the practice manager of the respiratory clinic and realized what we needed to do to better allocate those services yeah, I, lo I love that example because it is really, as you pointed out, it actually had an impact on the settlement. You know, sometimes yep. it can be 
and I know I've been in this situation as well, you know, preparing the cost report and you kind of, you have prior years and you kind of follow mappings that have been done in the past, but really it requires more intentionality sometimes to really look into, you know, where we're mapping these expenses and revenues. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, and yeah, so that, that kind of generates the best practice, you know, really making sure that we're reviewing our mappings. If you're not familiar with the cost report, maybe have your cost report prepare, explain it to you, you know, how they're mapping things and, and if there's any um, potential opportunities for improvement. I love how Brain, Blaine brought up um, tracking cost to charge ratios because a great way you can tell if something is amiss is if you see significant swings from year to year. And they might be very reasonable, but they could also be a sign that something has changed that we need to consider um, as we look to preparing. So again, it's really looking at these at least annually Definitely when you're filing your cost report and preferably um, earlier than that when you're running interims, as we'll get to in a, our, uh, a future best practice here. So the next one we had is our overhead expenses. And again, just to set the stage here on the cost report, what happens is um, I mentioned cost centers earlier, and we have different types of cost centers. So a portion of those cost centers are considered overhead. And the way the cost report treats overhead is it puts them into these cost centers and then it allocates them down to other areas. So other cost centers, such as your inpatient unit, your outpatient services, the ancillary services, non-reimbursable cost centers. It's gonna step, they call it a step down um, allocation. Uh, so they're stepping down costs to these other units. And you know the, the potential issue there is really, um, you know, there, there's a lot of methodologies. So CMS has certain prescribed methodologies for allocating your overhead to different departments. And um, those might be very appropriate for your hospital. They might not. There might be other methodologies that are available and you need to work with your Medicare administrative contractor on that. But really trying to understand, you know, um, does this make sense? At a high level, if I look at our overhead cost allocations, does this actually make sense where these are going? Um, yeah, I don't know, Blaine, do you have any thoughts on this one? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I kind of like to um, make this uh, simple um, uh, view on one specific column in the B1 statistics. So I like to think about the cafeteria column and start people thinking about it in this manner where um, if you have a off-site location like an RHC, are those employees actually going to be going to the hospital cafeteria to grab lunch? Are they actually leaving the RHC and going to the hospital and are they going to utilize the cafeteria there? If the answer is no, um, based on distance, those kind of things, then you don't need a statistic in the RHC lines, for instance. Um, and that way, if you don't put a statistic there, you're not pulling any of that overhead into the RHC lines that isn't really used to the RHCs. So that's kind of like a very um, clear, defined way of looking at that. And um, I definitely think it's also important to, um, for some of your other statistic columns, um, a, another easy one to think about is the gross revenues that's used in places. If you've made any movements within your reclasses or adjustments in your A6s and your A8s, you need to reflect that um, as your end number in that stats column. So if you're moving any salaries from um, one area to another, you need to make sure that your statistic is actually reflected with that movement. So it aligns with worksheet A in total. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I, Not just I, columns I, one and two, but yeah, <laughs> column seven at, at the end of worksheet day. Yep. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a key to keep in mind that we're moving around, we're shuffling around a lot of costs on the cost report, like on our A6 schedules and on our A8s where we're offsetting. So super important. I, I couldn't agree more. And I love the um, example you brought up because it's just one of those things that it just takes a common sense approach to the cost report, which again, if you're just kind of well, this is prior year, this is how we did it, and are there any significant variances between prior year? I think the bigger question is, have we been doing it correctly the whole time? Like, does this actually make sense when you when you think about it? Um, yeah. So your example is, is spot on. Um, and sometimes that's the hardest part, Wade, like actually getting yourself out of the preparation mode of just like putting the numbers in the boxes and is what we're doing actually making sense. So if you can have any other time to kind of like dive into that, maybe outside of the year, um, outside of the filing period. That's helpful as well. 
yeah yeah it's hard when you're in the like thick of, of crunch of, mode yeah <laughs> Very difficult to do that um, in real time, but yeah. So, I mean, the, again, the best practice here um, really to be just reviewing your cost allocations and taking even a common sense approach, uh, looking at variances from prior year, but also saying, does this make sense? And um, ideally you'd want to do this more than, than just when you're filing your cost report, but that's definitely a good place to start is, especially if you're in a review capacity and say you have a, you know, external firm preparing your cost report, right? You might not, you might not be involved in the details of preparation, but you can still look at things. And like Blaine mentioned, you can look and see, are we allocating um, cafeteria costs to an off-campus RHC? Does that make sense? Um, you know, you can you can be taking these very high level um, questions and putting them to the cost report, even if you're not as familiar with the specifics. So that would definitely be the best practice here. Our next best practice is tracking reimbursement. And, and uh, so, what happens is at the end of each year, um, a, a critical access hospital has to file a Medicare cost report. It's a requirement generally, and occasionally you'll have situations where you might have a short period cost report or multiple short period cost reports, but generally five months after your fiscal year end, you're required to file a Medicare cost report. And for traditional Medicare, what they do is they true up at the end of each year. So let's say you have a situation in which your interim rate was $2,500. Um, for your inpatient per diem. And throughout the year, you experience significant cost escalation. And now your rate when you file your cost report is $3,500 per day. So, um, so your per diem goes from $2,500 to $3,500. That's a significant differential. But Medicare will say, okay, we understand that your cost went up. So now you have a higher per diem. We're going to true up for that period of time. And so they will true up throughout the year. The challenge that can be faced, though, is that not all payers do this, most notably Medicare Advantage plans, which, as we all know, has been a very uh, significant um, presence as of late. We've seen those um, payers start to continue to grow. They've been growing for a while, but continue to grow and make up a significant amount of our payer mix, and they do not settle up at the year end. So let's say you had that 2,500 rate that you provided to your Medicare administrator, or I'm sorry, your Medicare Advantage plan and your costs wind up being 3500 at the end of the year. Well, you're going to you would have gotten paid the 2500 and you would have had to eat all those costs. They wouldn't be reimbursed um, from your Medicare Advantage plans. And so one of the things that we like to do or one of the things that we strongly recommend is to be tracking your settlement throughout the year for really all payers, right? Part of it is just general accounting. You're tracking your, you know, third party um, third party liabilities or or receivables, track those throughout the year. For critical access hospitals, cost-based reimbursement makes tracking that a bit of a moving target. And so one, we wanna be tracking that. And second, we also wanna be figuring out when does it make sense to maybe even file an interim Medicare cost report? Because for example, um, keeping with the Medicare Advantage plan example, um, they will honor whatever is listed on a rate letter that the Medicare administrative contractor provides. So if you file an interim cost report, at some point in time throughout the year, and then you send those to your Medicare Advantage plans, they're required to pay according to that rate. So it, it can be a bit of a balancing act. And I know, Blaine, you're mentioning that this has been particularly interesting from your perspective. I know that uh, this is a, yeah. a great challenge, but. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of a strategy um, to keep your best rates for as long as possible, specifically if you do have a lot of Medicare Advantage business. Um, a lot of the facilities we've seen, um, their Medicare Advantage business is actually outpacing their traditional Medicare business. So um, in your example, Wade, it would be advantageous to file those interim um, rate reviews with the max and to get a higher rate so that you could get that um, documentation over to the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and then on the other hand, if you have the opposite scenario, it would be better to not file an interim rate review to keep the higher rate with your Medicare Advantage plans. So um, it's definitely a balancing act and it just takes a lot of tracking and knowing where your business is and, and what's happening there. And to keep in mind that the Medicare Advantage plans do not settle up in most cases at the end of the year. Hey, Wade and Blaine, um, we have a couple of questions um, in the chat about, um, Mike was asking how many interim reports are facilities doing annually? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Mike. Um, 
Blaine, do you have any like practices that you've picked up on from either WBU or, or Maine Health as to how frequently you'd be filing interim cost reports? Yeah, so I, I think a little bit of it is MAC based. Some MACs will request that you file an interim cost report. Um, an interim rate review is usually what those are called. And we use uh, internal interim cost reports to kind of come up with those figures. Um, for the most part, um, I'm seeing that basically twice a year. Um, usually we'll get new rates right after we file a cost report. And then closer to the end of the year, they're asking again if we would like to use um, the interim rate reviews can be as simple as saying, I'd like to use my prior year cost report for the majority of the information. And then they also run a brand new PSNR at the time of their um, calculations to kind of true that up. But for the most part, I think that it's really important to at least have a mid-year check-in internally to see where you are. And then also when you're closer to your year end. So if you're on a calendar year, let's say, let's do a June 30, and then let's also do maybe a 930 or a, even a 1031 to check and see how we're coming in towards the end of the year, just so that you don't have any surprises when you're filing your cost report and settlements come through. I think that's the biggest um, uh, issue that uh, facilities face with their CFOs is saying like, we were expecting to receive this much or to pay this much. And then it's potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars off in an estimate because something's changed in your business. Um, best practice is to kind of track those once you have uh, about three or four months into the year, actually to track monthly, but bare minimum at least twice, twice a year. Yeah, no, I, I would certainly agree with that. Definitely um, the filing it, you know, you want to, you want to also consider, you know, the amount of time to ensure that there are no, because I've also run into this before, I'm sure you have Blaine too, but sometimes there can be outliers in specific months when it comes to either expenses or revenues. And so we also just kind of want to be sure. So to give the typical, it depends answer, it really does <laughs> depend on the facility. And as Blaine mentioned, it depends on the Mac. Um, so, but it, it's good to be monitoring it. I, I would say, you know, monitoring it um, frequently, even more frequently than maybe an interim cost report. And then once you get to that, as Blaine mentioned, you know, half a year in, and even looking a little further, you know, um, that's when we might or in, in my experience, that's when we might want to consider, you know, that interim uh, rate. So again, completely agree with what um, yep. Lane was saying. And it looks like we've got another question. So relative to overhead cost allocations, are you aware of a practice to establish a separate corporate entity with the hospital being the sole corporate member, moving some of the non-cost-based services underneath that corporate entity to remove the non-cost-based reimbursable services from the cost report? The hospital would still assign costs for overhead to that non-reimbursable service, but would do it at a fair. Okay, so it, it would be, if I'm understanding the question, it's more of, do we create a separate entity, which we then handle on A81, as opposed to um, stepping down a bunch of um, overhead via the B1 statistics, if I'm, if I'm understanding that question correctly. I would say that, yes, um, I, I am aware of certain situations like that. Uh, it really does, it really does depend, again, on the organization, what exactly you are um, trying to accomplish. And so, Tim, if um, I'd be happy to chat a little bit more about this after the um, presentation, just to get a, a better understanding of the specific um, circumstances you're wrestling with. But it's a good, good question. And yes, have, have heard of that. Um, definitely something to be mindful of and go through due diligence. Um, yeah, this is good. Love it. Uh, so our next, next best practice here is really understanding your service mix. So in the spirit of making sure we're tracking things throughout the year, we, um, we want to be sure we're understanding service mix because, and I think we've touched on it a few different times now, you can't just take prior year and roll it forward and expect nothing to change and then hope that, you know, you're gonna be accurate in understanding what, what you might be reimbursed in a given year. You have to really evaluate, have we had changes in service mix, both at you know the CA level and then even at a, a corporate level, Blaine, which I know you, you, ex you expressed is really being in that system perspective. We gotta take that into consideration as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, from the system perspective, it's really important to understand what's happening, uh, not just with your individual facility um, that you're working on, but what if you brought in another facility into the system, and that's going to draw some of your overhead that gets allocated down to each individual hospital and, and cause less of a portion of that pie to go to your critical access facilities, um, especially if you bring in an in a larger acute care within the year, a larger PPS facility within the year, then that's going to take a bigger chunk of the overall allocation of those services. Um, in addition to that, I think that it's really important to ensure that whatever, um, however your corporate structure could be set up, um, they should be charging your entities throughout the year for those integrated services, you know, IT costs, finance costs, things like that. Are you getting charged appropriately for what you're going to get allocated back into the cost report? So in one of those scenarios, you know, you would actually remove the cost from your cost report via the A81 of what's on your trial balance. Um, and then with that offset, you would get a amount back pushed through back through the eight ones from the home office. If you are removing more cost and receiving less back from that home office, that's going to be a negative impact and vice versa, which you would ideally like to see is that you're charged less than what you're going to be receiving back from that home office. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more if you're, which more and more cause are becoming part of larger systems, right? There are still yep. Uh, many purely independent cause out there, but there's a lot of them that at the very least might have some sort of management agreement with, with the local system. And so that's where you start seeing the home office allocations come in. So service mix changes aren't necessarily, as you said, you know, specific to your hospital. They could be, it could be impacted by a number of things. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Just caution. Don't always rely on prior year. Um, <laughs> it's definitely a big caution. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So when we're looking at this best practice, right, uh, again, we just want to be um, understanding changes that happen in our business. They can impact your reimbursement. They can impact your cost report. And again, that prior year um, can be very helpful in some respects, and we can still keep a shell of a prior year carried forward process, but it requires a lot of critical thinking and a word of caution, as Plain said. We can't just take everything and just roll it forward, no question that, because of because of things like this. Um, similarly, we've got the best practice of really incorporating audit findings. So when you file your cost report, um, you file it and it's subject to audit or desk review by your local Medicare administrative contractor. You know, I remember my experience doing this, and and there there was a lot of of um, attention that went into identifying, you know, critical access hospitals and which ones would be getting a desk review, which ones would, would be getting an audit. Um, so it's very important to know that your, your cost reports are all subject to audit. They might not all be audited, but having them out there and, and sent to your Medicare administrative contractor, which you're required to do, does subject them to some form of review. And the challenge we find is that um, in some cases, you can have a cost report that you submitted a while back, it could be a year, it could be even more than that, in which you would receive a notification of a desk review coming up or an audit from your local Medicare administrative contractor. Um, and because of this, and then you also have to keep in mind that there are adjustments made or potential adjustments made. And so um, because we have such a big period of time, you might have already filed additional cost reports in that time, and there may be issues that arise um, from that, that audit or desk review that you might need to go back and look at prior um, filed cost reports to look at as well. So yeah, Blaine, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so um, I've seen recently, you know, some of the Macs are quite far behind in their processing of these audits. And, you know, we've had um, some audits recently from, you know, the late teens, so 17, 18 kind of time frame, and they're trying to get caught up. So what we'll find is that we, you know, finish, a, let's say a 2017 year audit, and then they immediately are jumping into 2018. Well, we have just digested the findings from the 2017 audit, and we don't necessarily have enough time to go out and prep an amendment for the 2018 before that 
goes into um, review by the Mac. So I think that what's really important there is to understand what's coming out of your audits when you get that final adjustment report, making sure that you um, agree with the audit findings first off. Um, and if not, then you do have a time period where you can dispute those audit findings. Um, and then at that point, if you are jumping right, if the Mac is jumping right into your next fiscal year, then what you can do is, you know, uh, set aside some reserves for potentially the liabilities that you might owe on that same adjustment. We do see that the auditors frequently look back to what the audit adjustments were in a prior period audit and go in and look for that exact issue in the next filing. Because like we've mentioned lots of times, these are just carry forward issues um, that haven't been addressed yet. And you've got multiple years in between that the same issue could happen in those years. So if there's not a chance for you to amend, then definitely make sure that you're reserving for those issues going forward, quantifying what they are in those in those years subsequent to that audit and just kind of covering all your bases. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the common theme here of just no surprises. So if you yes if you have a <laughs> I, I like I like your point about how if you do um have an audit adjustment in a particular year and you know that there might be an impact in other years, just really thinking about, you know, how do we quantify that? Maybe it doesn't, maybe you don't need to file an amended cost report. Maybe you do. It all depends on what the adjustment is and how it may or may not impact another year. Um, so I think it's a great point. We just don't want to be surprised by this. It, it Absolutely. Be fun. So um, yeah, so looking to incorporate applicable audit findings, you know, you also have that period of time, as Blaine mentioned, to um, challenge some of the adjustments that are made during cost report uh, review. And I would, I would encourage um, critical access hospitals to take advantage of that. And whether it's in conjunction with your cost report preparer or just on your own or with your system, but really looking at that and evaluating it um, is important. And then I, I think we're coming in for a landing here with the cost report reviews best practice, where uh, this is very, very high level, but because of how complex a Medicare cost report is, um, and because really at the end of the day, you know, you know what you know, and there may be areas um, that have changed since the prior year. There might have been new regulations or there might have been a change to a form uh, on the cost report. There are so many things that can change. And so really what we want to be thinking about is how do we have a review process in place? You know, do we have a review process in place or is it just somebody who is um, solo preparing the cost report, doing the whole thing from you know, bringing down the trial balance and mapping those all the way to doing the final review, you know, that's probably not um, best practice because we want to have multiple sets of eyes on it when possible. We also know that this is kind of the gold standard to have a multi-tiered review process, but it is something that I think is worth striving for. Uh, and yeah, yeah. What, are, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I completely agree, Wade. I think that that is definitely the gold standard to have a multi-tiered review, um, no matter if the cost report is paired by a consulting group or external to your organization, even the internal reimbursement group at systems, um, still having a multi-tiered review within that reimbursement group is very important. Um, we like to try to have most of our prep work done at least a month in advance of our filing deadline because not only out of do you need time to actually do reviews, thorough reviews, but then if there are any things that need to be changed and um, a cost report could be worked on literally for years, you could always find something to work on. So you will find something during those reviews that oh, was missed during prep or just needs to be tweaked. Um, and you also need time for the preparation, whoever has been preparing your cost reports to go back in and make those changes. Um, I think that what's important for these multi-tiered reviews is to focus in on, okay, here's the whole list of what we would like to change in the cost report. And and if you're running out of time with your filing deadline, then where's the biggest bang for your buck, essentially? What is going to make the most impact for your facility? How are you going to keep um, as much 
in your system, in your facility as possible. Because like we mentioned with the last slides, audits happen years and years later. So if you're paying out a large liability, is that accurate? Can you reduce that liability? Is there something in your cost report that's not aligning in the right way? You know, go back, going back a couple slides, that's that was my EKG and respiratory clinic issue um, that we knew something was wrong. And that's how we kind of focused in on a large dollar item that we could get before filing. Um, if for some reason you um, are struggling with meeting your filing deadlines and you can't get to that, again, reserve for things on your books if you can. Also, you can do an amended. So there's multiple options, but try to do as much as possible before that filing deadline. Yeah, as much as we can, as much as we can. Um... So with that, you know, this is just a, a quick slide that shows your settlement summary um, on the Medicare cost report, the front facing page, and it just gives a, you know, estimate regarding the number of hours to complete the cost report. I know Blaine and I can both test to just how much detail goes into the cost report and how much time goes into the cost report. You have those five months after your fiscal year ends, and it's like a mad rush to get everything in. And so, again, just furthering the point that, you know, cost report reviews are, um, they're very helpful because it's it's can be sometimes a challenge when you're say a preparer to get out of that and go into more of a review objective perspective you've been working in it a long time and so mm -hmm. you know again just multiple sets of eyes can can go a long way and, and that 674 hours just one last thing that's about 16 weeks so um keep that in mind that when they they say that this it really does take quite a long time um to pr prep and get everything ready Oh yeah, it sure does. It absolutely does. Um, so now that we've completed the best practices uh, section, we're gonna go into some common reimbursement opportunities. Again, being mindful of time, um, we do have one which will probably um, you know, blaze over for, for this time, but we already touched on it. We'll touch on it very briefly, but you know, these are some of the common reimbursement opportunities we see and we'll delve into what we mean um, for each one. So the first one we've got here is Medicare bad debts. And you know, at a, a high level, again, for those who aren't in the weeds of preparation, traditional Medicare will reimburse you 65% of allowable um, patient responsibility amounts, so deductible and coinsurance amounts for your Medicare beneficiaries that um, haven't paid those balances. You can claim those on your cost report if you follow a whole bunch of rules and you prepare a listing that's in line with um, CMS regulation. And if you do that appropriately, you can get 65% of those back. Um, it is, it's not a substitute for, we want to make sure we're, we're doing good collection efforts and we're trying our best to resolve these balances prior to them going to bad debt. But on the off chance that we, we aren't able to collect, there is this um, backdrop for our traditional Medicare uh, providers. And the challenge we really see is that it's so difficult now, especially with audits, um, you know, I, I remember it was a focus when I was back at the MAC, and I think it continues to be a focus, right, Blaine, on, on bad debts? Absolutely. Absolutely. The bad debt process is very difficult. Um, samples are asked for, and sometimes the, the hardest part is um, supporting everything that's in your logs um, when yeah. those samples are picked. So I think it's definitely really important to kind of partner with your patient financial services, revenue cycle, whatever it might be called at your facility, um, to make sure that you guys are... Um, getting the accurate information from the experts in, in those um, electronic record systems. And also just another, just quick word of caution, uh, since things are so far behind, which I think I've mentioned um, previously, uh, sometimes we're moving from one EHR to another. Um, mm -hmm. So at that point, are your systems being sun, are they sunsetting at some point? Do we have everything we need out of a legacy system? And, and that's, that's really um, caused some issues with a few of the facilities I worked on where things just weren't migrated over like they should have been into more of a storage, storage kind of facility. Yeah, no, that's a great point. If we have those EMR transitions, yeah, the documentation is the keys to the kingdom for claiming Medicare bad debts. And if we can't substantiate them, you might as well not even put them on a listing if you can, because they're just going to get looked yeah. at, scrutinized. 
and they don't just throw out the one line they will extrapolate that finding across your entire population so that's why that's really important so it's not about just like oh let's just test it and include that one that we might not be able to support well they'll take that error rate and ding your entire population of your bad debt log so definitely yeah. important Oh yeah, super important. And it looks like we've got a question in the chat. Um, is there a different form of reimbursement for bad debts associated with dual eligibles? And you know, this is it's a great point. So there's actually different, um, even from an audit perspective, there's differences between dual eligibles and what might be listed as operational or truly self-pay. There's also a different process that, that might be followed if we have um, patients who aren't dual eligible but who encountered other circumstances. You know, if we experience a um, you know, a death or something like that. There's a whole different um, process for documentation. So there's really a range of, um, there's not all bad debts are the same. Yeah, estate issues, bankruptcy, those kind of things. Those are a little bit harder to support sometimes. Yeah, so there's a, yeah, Tim, you're absolutely right. There are, there are multiple types of bad debts and they're treated differently. And it's important to be aware of that as you're preparing your bad debt logs. Um, so we can certainly touch base on more of the specifics as well. I think, you know, Tim and I will connect after, but definitely a great point that not all bad debts are the same. Um, this is just where you would find it on your cost report, E-3 part five for your inpatient, and then E part B for your outpatient shows the allowable and then the um, reimbursable, which is just the allowable multiplied by 65. And then there is a separate line specific to dual eligibles to Tim's question here. Um, that has, um, yeah, I want to be careful about saying something will definitely be audited in a certain way, but historically my experience has been those are looked at in a different way from traditional bad debts. Um, and so, yeah, we're really the solution or best practice here uh, or opportunity is to make sure we're, we have a clean listing, that we have the documentation in place, keeping in mind all the different nuances uh, and really understand that our, our MACs are, are auditing these pretty consistently. And so, and the impacts of getting one item um, without documentation is more than just that one item. There can be a risk of extrapolation. And so there, there might be a disproportionate um, impact there. Uh, overhead cost allocations. Again, I know we're a little over, but basically we just, we see a lot of errors that come down to have we viewed our overhead cost allocations um, with that, that layer of common sense, right? And so I think it's really important. We, we just see this too often. We have costs going somewhere where it might not make sense, or we have double counting of expenses. So we have a direct costing of certain um, expenses as well as an overhead allocation. There's so many ways that we can, we can um, that this can be an issue. So again, but just for the sake of time, we really want to make sure we're reviewing these, uh, that we have some sort of common sense approach to the review, as well as historical context. Related parties. So this is where we have our, our critical access hospitals that are part of the system. And basically the way it works is you um, can receive a cost allocation. This often happens through a home office cost statement. So you'll receive a number of costs from a parent entity that um, can be passed on. And obviously as a critical access hospital, there are cost-based reimbursement implications here. Um, so, you know, we just see a lot of opportunity here. Are we getting the appropriate allocation? Does it make sense going back to our common sense approach? Um, and, you know, Blaine, from your experience being in two, two different systems, like what are some of the opportunities you see here? Yeah, I think that the biggest opportunity for this is to make sure that the critical access facilities are receiving absolutely everything that they can. Um, and that's really based on how your system is set up and which form of allocation methods that you're using. So if, if at all possible, it's nice to have a actual stats and your functional allocations from the home office so that you can pull those dollars down into the critical access where they belong instead of just using a uh, generic pooled stat for everything or allocation method for everything to kind of push the cost where it needs to go just based on general expenses. So if, if there's a way for you to have a allocation method that's um, very specific for a certain um, integrated service, then that I think is the most appropriate way to go so that your cause don't lose out on anything that, that they deserve. Yeah, that's well put. Well put. Um, 
And this is your home office um, or related party schedule. I referenced it a little bit earlier. Um, work today-8-1, you report your amount of allowable costs and compare that to the expense that's recorded on your books. So there is a bit of a true up that occurs here. Um, just important to know from a review perspective. Uh, the next one is your physician standby or on-call costs in the emergency department. Basically, uh, to boil it down, if you have um, emergency room uh, providers, uh, physicians that uh, are compensated and they have time in which um, they are not treating patients, so they're not actively involved in treating the patients, they don't have that patient facing time, but they're on standby, they're, they're on call, they're ready. Um, that can be claimed on your Medicare cost report as allowable. The challenge that we often find is that um, providers still rely on things like time studies, you know, that might be a bit antiquated or they might not even be that accurate. And so what can happen is you can have a suboptimal um, reimbursement amount. There's also challenges with communicating to our providers why it's important to track this. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity here, but it, it does come down to documenting how much of your compensation for your ED providers is related to the standby on-call time. And Blaine, I know you mentioned that you've gone through an analysis of your system and found some promising results. Yeah, absolutely. So we had kind of gone down the path of using an electronic uh, system to uh, do this. There's a company called Versa Badge that kind of tracks the uh, providers and and what they're doing and um, the cost when we did a little bit of an analysis on it the cost for this is for what it would be for each facility versus how much we would have to in increase our standby time or availability time for um, the entire population was very small so we just had to increase our standby time or ed availability by five percent to actually cover the cost of implementing and paying for that versa badge um so for us it, it was kind of like well you know our our availability is so low at this point and and we believe that we're going to be able to cover that in addition that cost of the versa badge is an allowable cost it doesn't have to be removed in the regular a8 schedule so you get a little bit of natural allowability there as well so definitely just something to think about to kind of track um these physicians and and their their movements and um sometimes when we're talking about what's beneficial for reimbursement it's a little bit um counterintuitive to the physicians and the providers because they're gearing themselves on productivity and they view standby time as being not productive. Um, so uh, time studies kind of get a little bit jumbled if their standby time is coming in at a lower rate. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it's the issue of communication, right? Communicating why are we tracking this and, and yeah, yes. everybody at ease for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, this is where we would find it on worksheet AA2. We have the total remuneration, the fancy way of saying compensation. I'm not sure where remuneration, it's probably an older term that I'm just not, I'm, I'm too young to know what it is. But um, anyway, so that's the, the amount of um, compensation. And then we've got the professional component, again, that time with, with patients providing that care, and then the provider component, which would be that standby time. So this is where you would find it. Um, and then the last item, I know we're, we're quite a bit over here, so um, is just the provider-based rural health clinic reporting. Um, you know, I think the key here is we often see an opportunity when it comes to recording our RHC visits. If we have provider-based rural health clinics, we see um, provider-based rural health clinics at many critical access hospitals. Um, and so the, the risk or the opportunity we see is that oftentimes we're not carving out RHC services when it comes to visits when it comes to allowable cost, when it comes to our FTE count, um, there we need to limit this to our RHC uh, services. And so it, that is much easier said than done. And, you know, Blaine, I know we were talking about, you know, how we can generate reports out of a system, but they might not be showing us what we need to, to file these provider-based rural health clinic. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that some of this also is based on how those providers are actually um, spending their days. Some, you know, we've seen at some systems that um, a provider will spend part of their day in the RHC and then also spend part of their day actually at the hospital, um, seeing patients there as well. So I think it's just being really careful about knowing what your report is actually showing you and how you count those visits and also the FTEs associated with that. If your physician isn't spending all of their time in the RHC, then it's not a full FTE that needs to be um, apportioned to the RHC line. Right. Yeah. I, I always kind of caution folks to look at your cost report at your M-3 series uh, and say, or M-2 and say, you know, do you see any round numbers, like holy round numbers? Like, you know, we have 1.0 mm -hmm. position FTEs. Like, do you really though? That uh, I don't know if, if that's accurate. That it's it could be accurate, but it's just it brings up questions. Yeah. Um, so really being mindful of how we're recording that. I'm sorry, M M dash two. Um, so M dash two series, an example of where we record our FTEs visits, uh, and it's important because it gets bumped up against a minimum productivity standard, and that can that has a potential to impact our reimbursement. Um, so at the end of the day, really reviewing our FTE visit counts, the costs that we're, that we're including in the provider-based RHC cost centers, making sure that we're carving out appropriately and even having a matching principle in there, right? Where if we're carving out certain costs, we're also carving out associated FTEs, associated visits, uh, making sure we have that consistency. Um, and with that, I apologize, we have gone... Uh, quite a bit over, but there was some really good interaction. I enjoyed the, the questions, and I think we might have some that we need to address after the fact, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we love to talk cost reports, so i um, happy to do that. Um, but with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to my colleague for the next session. So I'll stop. Here. And thank you all for the participation. It makes it, it, makes it really uh, engaging. Hey there, good morning. Can everyone see my screen? Wait, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Or Hillary? I, I see it, Claire. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Kelly. I'm a senior consultant with Stroudwater. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about the value of rural organizations, specifically rural hospitals, and how that value is in our opinion, really misunderstood and how that can impact potential partnerships or existing partnerships. Really quickly, um, here's my contact information. I know we're gonna be pressed for time today. So if you have questions and we don't get to them, please feel free to, to reach out to me directly. Happy to, to chat with anyone offline about questions that come up for this presentation. So while yes, we're going to be talking about how the value of rural organizations can impact partnerships, whether you're in an existing or a potential partnership. Um, the real basis of this presentation and what this presentation is really about is about risk and risk analysis. It's about analyzing the risk profile of your organization, because that's what informs all decisions that you make as an organization, whether that's looking at a potential partnership or whether that's going for a performance improvement plan and remaining independent, or in some cases doing both at the same time. The risk profile will inform those strategic options that are available to you and, and really give you some, some direction on what's possible. In our experience, typically we see five common outcomes when it comes to rural organizations. On the far right, you know, thriving independence, we think this is what every rural organization wants to be. You want to be independent and you want to be thriving. You want to be able to reinvest in your asset base. You want to be able to add service lines to your community and make sure there's guaranteed access to your community. Something that's, you know, relatively on par with that would be being in a good partnership or having a, a good partner, one where the partnership is mutually beneficial, um, your rural organization feels valued, is, is given support, and is sustainable with, within your community. Unfortunately, a lot of the organizations that we deal with are in what we call strategic drift or purgatory. And this is really where 
there's no action being made on the direction for the organization. They're going about with status quo. And frankly, a lot of times folks haven't, leadership boards haven't analyzed the risk profile of their organization and don't know how they're deteriorating over time. A lot of times folks will look at um, performance to budget or performance to year to date, but rarely do organizations look at three to five years you know, in, in one outlook to see, okay, we've really deteriorated in three to five years where that may not be apparent in just looking at budget or compared to previous year to date. Unfortunately, when that happens, um, typically if you've waited too long to, to look at those items, it can end up leading you to a bad partnership or in the more dramatic and drastic cases, it can, it can lead to, to closure. So if, you don't listen to anything else that I say today. This is the this is the slide to tune in for. It's really kind of what what you need to know. And there's five key th things that we think um, folks really need to know. The first is that of the 60% of rural hospitals that are in partnerships, a lot of those partnerships are deemed bad partnerships because most systems are missing critical critical aspects of rural value, meaning rural hospitals are criminally undervalued um, within certain systems. Um, and frankly, that's that's not something we want to see or, or maintain. And it's what makes um, the connotation of partnership really have a negative tone is because these are more common than good partnerships that are really emphasizing rural value. Additionally, no one's going to stumble across your value. It's your job to be able to articulate and be able to quantify your value for potential partners, um, show them, educate them on how rural hospitals have value and how it can be operationalized. Identifying win-wins. So if you're in an existing partnership, being able to identify low-hanging fruit or win-wins for, for you and the system. It's about making better decisions, better sharing resources, et cetera. Making sure your partner understands your value. Do they get the, the minutia that comes with rural organizations? You know, do they understand incremental cost versus reallocated costs? Do they understand the value of, of incremental referrals? Um, and then we go with the, the four no-nos, which is know your risk profile, know your value. No one else will promote your value. So be able to speak to your value to, to others. And then there's no risk-free option, meaning whether you choose to remain independent and pursue operational improvements or whether you choose to potentially partner or whether you choose to do, you know, maintain the current path that you're on, all of those come with inherent risks. So really it's about what strategic option is gonna help you minimize those risks or mitigate those risks. So our agenda today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about what we're getting wrong when it comes to rural healthcare, then go into some of the, the kind of headwinds that rural healthcare is, is facing, when it's appropriate to think about partnerships, how to ensure those partnerships create value, and then finally, we have some case studies based on our experience of some, some pitfalls um, to avoid and how to avoid them. So what are we getting wrong when it comes to rural health care? We often hear that rural health care is a dumpster fire, hence our pretty, pretty drastic graphic for you on this page. We hear that the, econ the, the economies of rural health care are unsustainable you know, a lot of times based on fully allocated costs. And we hear that the only way to make the economy sustainable is to shut down or curtail rural operations and reduce, you know, to reduce costs, we have to reduce resources. But are these statements actually correct? And in our experience, we think that they're missing critical key pieces. And a couple examples of that first, a lot of times when folks are looking at fully allocated costs, those include fixed costs. Fixed costs shouldn't be included when, when looking at that for, for a real affiliate. A lot of times there's no discussion of home office cost allocation. Many folks think that this just happens. Fully all, um, home office cost allocations don't happen without the critical access hospitals. And additionally, incremental referrals. We don't hear people talk about incremental referrals enough. Um, an example of this would be, um, uh, we were working with some education for a system and it's a six to seven um, rural hospital system. 
um, and they had just required acquired a, a another rural affiliate. We when we were talking, that most recent rural affiliate asked to share their screen with us, and what they showed was the previous year when they were not affiliated within the system, two thirds of their emergency department transfers were going to a competitor down the road. Now those two thirds are coming into the system. There's inherent value in those referrals that are coming into the system that typically is not quantified or talked about when it comes to, to rural organizations. So this is the, the history portion of the, the presentation. And what we talk about here is kind of a, an analogy for what we think is going on in rural healthcare. So in World War II, 60% of the Allied bombers that were flying over Germany were, were being killed or taken prisoner um, or, or wounded. So researchers for the Center of Naval Analysis were painstakingly reviewing all the planes that came home, understanding where they had been hit. And they found that the majority of these planes were taking hits on the wings and the body of the plane. So their solution was, okay, if we reinforce the wings and the body of the plane, yes, they're harder to fly, harder to maneuver, but technically they should be okay and more would come home. But this analysis was completely incorrect and it took one person to point this out, but they were fundamentally looking at all the planes that had made it home. So they were creating a map of the places where the bomber could be shot and survive. They weren't creating a map of where they, they couldn't survive because those planes were missing, they had been shot down. So something similar is happening in, in rural healthcare where we're doing the analysis incorrectly. Another example I'll use for, for baseball fans out there, if you've ever read the book or seen the movie Moneyball, this is a story about the Oakland A's and how they discovered that the supposed experts of baseball, i.e. the scouts, the folks that were recruiting the top tier players to the major organizations, you know, such as the Yankees, the Red Sox that had budgets of 125 million compared to the Oakland A's with budgets of only 40 to 44 million. These recruiters were fundamentally undervaluing some baseball players. They weren't looking at certain statistical analyses such as on base percentages that led to, to winning games. So the Oakland A's took advantage of this and were able to recruit these undervalued players and it actually brought them to the playoffs two years in a row. And now it's one of their analysis is what's been adopted across all of, all of MLB. But the point remains, the experts were getting it wrong. They were doing the wrong analysis. And we think that's the same thing that's happening in rural healthcare today. So an example of this, um, that's more of a healthcare example, as we worked with an organization that was part of a seven hospital system and they were allocating to their rural PPS affiliate about $25 million of overhead to the affiliate's general ledger, which resulted in about a $13 million operating loss. Of that 25 million, about 80% were, were fixed costs and should not have been considered when evaluating the contribution margin of the affiliate. When you look at the actual contribution margin to the system, it was actually about 17 million before um, including things like additional um, referrals or service area referrals for the area. So if you look at those other levers on top of that 17 million, there was an additional 22 million for a total contribution margin to the system from the rural affiliate of about 39 million. Now, again, this is a rural PPS hospital. If it was a critical access hospital, it's probably going to be a third or about a quarter of this. But what that doesn't factor in, because this is a PPS, is the home office cost allocation. So the critical access hospitals would also be able to take advantage of that. So what are some headwinds that we're seeing really drive partnerships in rural health care? I don't think a lot of these will be surprises to any of you who are so involved in rural health care, but they're important touchstones for us to briefly talk about. The first is that we have declining Medicare margins. Again, I don't think this is a surprise to you. You know, rural hospitals do get reimbursed more than PPS hospitals, but these margins are still declining um, across the board. Stratwater looks at the three most prominent rating agencies. They publish a not-for-profit healthcare outlook on a biannual basis. According to the, the outlook most recently available, Moody's predicts a outlook transfer from negative to stable for 2024. They're more of an optimistic outlook compared to Fitch or Standard & Poor's or 
SNP. And they're saying that revenues will um, balance out or potentially surpass expenses, even though there's still a um, labor shortage and we're seeing wage increases. Fitch and S&P are saying, no, we think this is going to be deteriorating or a negative outlook for healthcare. Um, again, really emphasizing the contract labor expenses are still going to be hitting organizations hard. Fitch, interestingly, has said that for smaller organizations, these effects will be um, stronger. So the smaller organization you are, the more strongly you're going to feel these effects. Some other industry risks that we're seeing, we talked a little bit about Medicare reimbursement levels that really are not keeping up with inflation. We're seeing the end of a pandemic era provision that prevents states from Medicaid disenrollment. So you're gonna see more uncompensated coverage begin to occur. Um, we're seeing continued scrutiny of the 340B program. So making it harder for, for rural contract pharmacies to potentially join. We're seeing increased scrutiny of mergers by federal and state governments. So this really is getting at um, increased scrutiny from the Federal Trade Commission or F FTC when it comes to certain affiliations and mergers has really picked up under this administration. Additionally, we're seeing growth in Medicare Advantage plans, which is leading to more denials uh, by insurers, as typically these plans don't, don't cover a lot of the care that others do. And we're also seeing bond covenant breaches. So there's a lot of statistics on, on this slide. The three one, the three that I really think are, are key here are the deterioration in median days cash on hand, median operating margin, and median debt service coverage over the past uh, couple of years. All three of those statistics you do see, you do, do see a decline as a kind of state of the of the healthcare environment. Additionally, this is from SNP or Standard and Poor's, and this shows the U.S. not-for-profit um, healthcare outlook revisions over the past few years. The revisions that are in blue or anything above the x-axis are favorable revisions, where anything in that yellowy orange color um, are all unfavorable revisions. And the key here is in 2019 and, and 2021, we'll leave 2020 out as, a, as an outlier, but in 2019 and 2021, the ratio of favorable to unfavorable was relatively positive. You had more favorable outlook revisions than, than unfavorable. From 2022 onward, we're seeing that trend switch. We're seeing an inverse uh, uh, trend where you're seeing a lot more unfavorable than favorable uh, outlook revisions occur. So how do these, you know, health industry factors and headwinds impact industry consolidation? How do they impact partnerships? And what we'll say is since 2017, we've been seeing a, a decline in, in partnerships. Um, and it's just beginning to uptick again since 2021. But while we're seeing a decline, you can see on the bar chart below, the average size of the smaller party that's involved in a partnership is actually increasing. Meaning, yes, there's a decline in partnerships, but the partnerships that are occurring are between larger organizations. So it could be between two health systems, two large regional affiliates. It's not necessarily a critical access hospital affiliating with a regional referral system anymore. And we think that's what's led to a lot of the scrutiny from the FTC is because these are larger partnerships and mergers that are occurring in the market. So when is it appropriate to, to think about partnerships for an organization? We have a saying at Stroudwater that time is, is never a neutral factor. And what we mean by this is that it's important to make effective and education, educated um, decisions when it comes to your organization in, in a timely manner and to not let perfect be, be the enemy of good. And an example we'll give here is how the cost of delay can really impact uh, a partnership. So uh, an organization that we were that we knew was a strong PPS, you know, uh, 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 hospital that was looking for a regional referral system partner because they were going to face some major capital investments and needs down the line. They had a preferred partner come to the table that actually offered a $25 million capital infusion to the to the rural PPS hospital. 
However, the board of the rural PPS hospital elected to defer the proposed affiliation. They didn't say no outright, but they just wanted to, to wait a little while, wait a year um, to make some other decisions. Unfortunately, when they came back to the table a year later, their preferred partner had entered into other commitments and had to then pull back on that 25 million that was originally on the table. Six months after that, the rural PPS hospital elected to affiliate on the terms previously negotiated, but they didn't get that, that $25 million investment commitment. So that's how kind of the cost of delay, the cost of not making effective decisions can really impact the leverage that you have when it comes to partnerships or, or the, the ability to, to implement appropriate performance improvement plans that can really help turn an organization around before it gets to, to a certain point. Again, this is just an understanding that there's no risk-free option, whether you're partnering or looking for a partner or in an existing partnership, or whether you're pursuing an independent strategy, there is inherent operating risk and partner risk that come with, with both of those. So it's an understanding of based on the strategic options available to you, which strategy is gonna help minimize or mitigate the risks that are on the table. When you look at risks in relation to, to stress, we define the stress of, of hospitals kind of along this spectrum where a stable organization is gonna have consistent margins, it's gonna have growing top line revenue. Um, and that's what we would see as you know pretty, pretty stable. They're able to reinvest in their asset base um, and their growing market share. A stressed organization is gonna have about two years of declining margin or flat top line revenue. They're not, they're not growing, they're breaking even, um, but they're not able to, to really expand services. And then a distressed hospital, we would say is, you know, three plus years of declining or negative margins, um, decreasing top line revenue, reserves that are sufficient for less than one year. And they're really starting to implement cost cutting measures such as cutting specific service lines. A lot of the organizations that we deal with are really between, you know, the, the stressed and de-stressed side of, side of operations. So how are stress and risk related? We understand them as separate concepts, but how do they integrate together? If you're a distressed organization, you're gonna have enhanced operating strategic and deal risk. All three are gonna be, um, pretty pretty high. And what that means is you have less leverage when it comes to looking for potential partners. Um, and it's harder to implement certain performance improvement initiatives to really create an effective turnaround. An analogy I'll use is it's a lot easier to contain or put out a burn pile or a campfire than it is to contain or put out a wildfire. And once you reach the distressed kind of stage, that's a wildfire situation. Whereas if you're with a stressed stage, Yes, you have moderate operating and strategic risk as well as deal risk, but you do have uh, an ability to turn things around or, you know, look at and you have some leverage when it comes to potential partnerships should you choose to look at them or, um, you know, within your existing partnership. If you're a stable organization, you're going to have decreased, operate, decreased operating risk and strategic risk. Deal risk, you'll always have some inherent deal risk. Again, there's no risk-free option. Just because you're a stable organization, there's always risk when looking at partnerships. So again, that's not gonna be as low as your strategic and operating risk. So what are some key factors that affect risk? We tend to have four risk domains. We look at financial risk, operating risk, value risk, and market risk. And then there's um, different indicators within each of those domains. And all those indicators can overlap and are integrated with one another. So for example, within value risk, if you look at the quality of an organization that can impact volume, which impacts revenue growth, which impacts market position. And all of these different um, indicators have trends over time. So it's really important for leadership and board leadership to look at the cumulative effects and changes of these indicators and risk factors over time, again, not in those uh, year silos, so they can see the strategic direction of, of the organization based on, on it, these indicators. So we've talked about how there's misconceptions around the value of rural organizations. We've talked about the headwinds rural organizations are facing, and we've talked about 
when to potentially think about a partnership. Now let's talk about how, if you're thinking about a partnership or in an existing partnership, how do you ensure that that partnership creates value for, for your organization? The building block for a lot of this is, is, is trust. And that means, you know, within your organization, within leadership, within boards, developing a common fact base or really looking factually at what your risk profile is, understanding where there's performance gaps and developing a shared strategic objective, <coughs> excuse me, shared strategic objectives that can help guide your organization as you move forward. And then the key is really not losing sight of those fundamentals, no matter if you choose to do performance improvement or if you choose to look at a partner or enhance an existing partnership. It's what decisions are going to guarantee sound governance and management, strategic alignment, and enhance operational performance for your organization. So when we talk about partnerships, there's a variety of partnership structures that are available. Not all partnerships are created equal. And a lot of times it's about picking the correct partnership structure based on your organization and what you want in terms of the strategic direction of your organization. It really comes down to what's an appropriate structure with a preferred partner. As you move to the right on this chart, um, there's a greater degree of integration. So, um, those in a sole member substitution typically have are more inter intertwined in terms of a partnership and system than those that are in, in a co-op. So this is really the value levers that we see that are incredibly important for rural health systems to know and to be able to speak to when it comes to just A, if you are a rural organization or B, want to look at existing partnerships or potential partnerships. Being able to speak to these and understand what you're worth as an organization is key. Each of these levers are potentially quite significant. And what we've seen in our practice is that either on a standalone or combination basis, getting these things right and helping organizations to get them right can have significant and lasting positive benefits. And what I will say is the last two bullets on this list, the value of attributive lives and a primary care base that is cash flow positive and the true value of incremental referrals are often sub-optimized and are very significant opportunities that frankly, a lot of systems um, um, don't value and, and don't see. So being able to speak to those and being able to quantify those is incredibly important when it comes to, to being able to to promote your organization. So if we go back to kind of our continuum of partnership structures, um, after looking at those value levers, certain levers can only be applied based on the structure you choose. So for example, home office cost allocation, that really only applies to joint venture agreements and, and stronger um, because you really have to have that financial integration for that to really apply. So again, it's about picking the structure based on what value levers do you want to take advantage of for your organization. So what does this mean in terms of, if I'm in an existing partnership, how can I use these value levers to potentially enhance this existing partnership? And how do I start having conversations around these? We typically advise Let's look for some low hanging fruit. Let's build the trust between the two organizations of saying, hey, we really think there's something here. How do we build upon this together? Are there items that have a quick ROI? Um, you know, sometimes cost report opportunities will take a little bit of time to implement because of the cycle of them. Um, is there a way we can look at our incremental referrals pretty quickly? Is there a way we can quickly optimize on 340B that we haven't been before? What things strategically fit um, that can be, be captured and acted upon on a relatively fast basis and then work on some of the harder stuff once you have that low-hanging fruit under your belt. What does this rural value and these value levers mean when you're going through a process of looking for a new partnership? Really, the, the couple key things that we, we harp on for this is make sure you run a competitive process when you're looking at potential partners. Make potential partners compete for the privilege of being your partner. It gives you leverage to have multiple folks at the table. 
use that time when you're you're vetting multiple options to educate prospective partners on your value. Do they understand the value of rural organizations? Are they willing to understand the value of rural organizations? Additionally, evaluate their track record. Do they have rural affiliates? Have you know, they come through on their promises with rural affiliates? Will they, you know, knowing your, your value, are they willing to adjust terms that are reflected in contractual based on your rural value and based on their new understanding? And really, finally, do not sign a letter of intent or anything until you have an acceptable term sheet in hand that really meet your strategic objectives. Typically at Stroudwater, we like to see a letter of intent that's reflective of what would be in a definitive agreement because it eliminates or really lowers the, the risk of what we call weasel words that are reflected between um, an LOI and definitive agreement, meaning that an organization can say, oh, we commit to up to 15 million in a new EMR. Well, up to means they can commit zero or give nothing to an organization for their EMR, but still meet the terms of the agreement. So it's figuring out, okay, how can we make sure the letter of intent is, is crafted in a way that we're really comfortable with and we're on the same page with the commitments going forward. So this is a case study um, that I'm really proud of. Uh, Stroudwater was retained to work with this critical access hospital. Um, it's about a 10 to $12 million organization, but they were projected to have a negative cash balance within, within two years and really needed to partner. So they were on the lines of distressed when we talk about kind of that, that um, um, uh, line of, of distressed, stressed and stable. Using the value levers that we just spoke about, Stroudwater was able to determine that just based on a partnership, um, the critical access hospital would be able to fund its 3.6 million of needed investments and also increase operating performance by about 670K annually. And we were able to show that to the different prospective partners that, that came to the table based on being able to quantify that information our client was able to get really strong, robust proposals from potential partners. And as of April, 2024, they signed an LOI and um, are set to close. Um, so it's, it's a really exciting thing to maintain healthcare in that community for an organization that is, and was seen as absolutely distressed to have a strong commitment from a large regional referral partner that is willing and committed to maintaining care in, in that community. And this is just a quick example of, of how we kind of quantify that value for, for potential partners. <clears throat> you can see we listed the performance improvement initiatives. We looked at swing beds, 340B, cost report opportunity, and the low and high estimate for home office cost allocation savings. Then we said the required investment would be about 3.6 million. We assumed 100% debt financing and a cost-based reimbursement of about 40%. And if you look at the net change in operating performance on the low estimate side, it never drops before six, below 670K. So again, just enabling a way to quantify this information is, is really helpful for, for prospective partners. So I know we're, we're close to time. So really quickly, just going to talk about a few case studies of, of things we've seen and, and would some we'd advise for and some we'd advise against. The first is looking at um, a, a case study where uh, we were brought in where a critical access hospital had already selected a preferred partner. Um, however, that critical access hospital had not run a competitive process and previously had shopped around to other regional re referral partners in their area and had one-on-one -on -one conversations. Of course, all those regional referral partners chat. And what ended up happening is our, our client had no leverage in those negotiations. The regional referral partner knew they had no other options on the table. They knew that other people had said no. So why would they take on the, the critical access hospital? So again, just a word to the wise of always run a, a competitive process when you're looking at partnerships. This on a similar note, we were retained by a critical access hospital that had, again, a preferred affiliation candidate identified, but the 
the the conversations had really stalled. They had signed an LOI, but nothing was really moving forward. Their preferred partner, which was a large regional referral center in the area, didn't understand the value of having a critical access hospital, a rural affiliate as part of their health system. Per our recommendation, we advised our client to have the terms of the LOI expire and then go back to the beginning and invite their preferred partner back to the table with others and run a competitive process and use that time, the competitive process to, um, to, to educate folks on their, their value and show their potential partners what they could be as part of their health system. Unfortunately, their original partner still didn't get that concept, didn't want to acknowledge it, didn't propose um, uh, a proposal that was that was robust enough to really give them what they they needed. And thankfully, another partner who had been involved in the discussion, who had a track record with rural affiliates, provided a very robust proposal that was exactly what our client wanted. And this was a pre-COVID. And so it's been five years since they've been together and it's been a really successful partnership to maintain healthcare in that community. We also wanna talk about, um, <laughs> we had a, a two clients where, um, we came and they formed a joint operating agreement. It was between a PPS hospital that had a critical access hospital and another PPS hospital. And those two organizations were separated by a mountain. Their JOA, which we did not do, they had entered into it, had been formed and it called for members to share profits and losses, but the member boards and assets would remain separate. So effectively, the member who lost more was owed a check by the member who lost less. So obviously, this was very toxic and <laughs> did not build a lot of trust between these two organizations. So again, where the structure was completely incorrect for what these two organizations needed, we came in, helped them dissolve that JOA, and then actually form with the same affiliate. So they both have their own agreements with, with separate affiliates um, and are very content to be all involved in that system together, but are no longer reliant upon, upon each other. And then our last case study is really where our client didn't understand the rural value, but it wasn't out of uh, neglect or being malicious. Um, we had a client that entered into discussions with a large multi-state health system um, regarding a potential affiliation. That large and really well-respected um, health system placed about only 100K in value on the home office cost allocation, where Stroudwater estimated about 3 million in annual value. So again, just a lack of understanding when it comes to rural health care and the minutia of rural health care. Again, not purposeful, just a lack of a gap in knowledge. Um, and they also weren't looking at you know, the modest change in, in referrals. As a result of Stroudwater pointing these things out, the prospective partner revised their initial offer, which didn't have a strong capital commitment or a local role in governance to include a, a capital commitment, service commitments, and a significant role in, in local governance moving forward. So again, creating a stronger, better deal for, for our co affiliate. So what are the key takeaways here? I think, you know, operational performance is foundational to any strategic option. Again, know your risk profile. Your risk profile is going to inform the strategic options available to you. Don't delay, you know, make sure you don't kick the can down the road, as we like to say it. Time is never a neutral factor. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Make sure you're looking, you know, not just year by year, but cumulative effects of what's going on to your organization so you're not in strategic drift know your value, make sure you do your homework and are able to promote your value and articulate that to, to potential partners, to your existing partner. Make sure you're able to be an advocate for your organization. There are no risk-free strategic options. So understanding which option is gonna be able to minimize the most risks that are facing your organization. How is the strategic options available gonna combat those headwinds that we talked about earlier? And finally, if you do choose to partner or find an existing partner, Make sure you run a process. Make sure you find a partner who understands your rural value or is willing to be educated on the value of rural. Make sure you define a structure that's going to benefit those value levers or hit those value levers that you want to include. And finally, make sure you have contractually enforceable terms um, that are available and, and, and really reinforce, again, what you want from, from a partnership. 
Thank you. I know we are right up on, on time, so I'll pass it over to my colleagues, Amy and Ryan, for, for their presentation on um, mastering revenue cycle um, KPIs essential strategies. Hey, thanks, Claire. I really appreciate it. appreciate the information that you shared with us and wanted to say that if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them through the chat. While Claire may not be able to respond to you right now, happy to get those questions answered and get back with you. So you can either put it in the Q&A or in the chat. And with that, I am going to look and share my screen and we will get started. Started. So I believe you all can see my screen now. And we're talking about mastering revenue cycle KPIs. Um, one of the reasons I, you know, as I was listening to Claire talk, one of the things that I kept thinking about was that it's really cool for that we're coming after her because she's talking about, you know, different strategies for these partnerships and these relationships. And one of the ways to really, you know, be able to hold people accountable and talk about it is looking at what your metrics say and what your your key process indicators say. And so we're going to be talking about the revenue cycle side of it, but there's some other areas just to keep your, your eye on that target. And so I'm going to hand it over to Ryan. Ryan, I'll let you just chat about our KPIs for us. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And I know uh, we've been uh, had so much info on, on cost reporting and affiliations. We may uh, be a little bit short on time, so we may jump through some of these slides a little bit quicker than normal. But uh, really, our, our, our path for today is we're going to start with some of our objectives. Um, you know, real basic, what is a KPI? How are they used? Um, how you can develop KPIs if you have nothing in place? some examples and formulas, and then some best practices around how to use those KPIs, you know, in your, in your hospital. So again, the basics, you know, we'll start with, this is a, a oversight of the revenue cycle, um, a slide that Amy and I use fairly often in some of our, our presentations. Uh, we have the claim life cycle there in the middle, but on that far right side, you do see that analytics pillar where your KPIs would, would traditionally fall but also, as we'll see, and we kind of walk through this conversation here, you know, you'll be using those KPIs throughout that entire life cycle and really help to determine what's being successful and what, what is not successful within that revenue cycle. So starting very basic, what is a KPI? You know, a KPI is a measure of a specific item or objective over time. Um, it helps to measure financial health, stability, and trajectory, and it also gives value for further decision making. You know, when we think of those character characteristics that would make a good KPI, we think of things that are actionable, directional, accurate, and measurable. Um, so without getting, you know, too, you know, simplified here, you know, when you think of a KPI, what you're looking for is something that quite honestly meets those three words. It's, it's key, meaning they're tied to something important and worth paying attention to. It is performance related, meaning it helps you, you know, understand how well some activity is going along in the business. And then it should be an indicator. You know, it gives you something that you can measure uh, that actually matters to you within, within revenue cycle. Is this metric going up, down? Is it progressing, regressing, things of that nature? So kind of giving you some health and um, idea of the stability of, of a particular function within that KPI. Another item that is, I'd say, closely related to KPIs that you might, might hear for, fairly frequently is OKRs, which are objectives and key results. Um, in comparison to KPIs, your OKRs are usually, I'd say, um, reevaluated more frequently, and they may change a little bit more with your overall organizational objectives. Um, I, I tend to think of OKRs as more ambitious and a little more aspirational, and, and again, more fluid over time. You know, in comparison, your KPIs are um, top-down established criteria that you really use to measure, you know, ongoing performance within your organization, you know, month to month, day to day, year to year. You know, your, your KPIs evaluate functional items of your business and your processes a little bit more than, than your OKRs would. And then generally speaking, um, different hospitals probably likely have very similar sets of KPIs or should um, in comparison, your OKRs may change, um, again, from, from hospital to hospital based on what their you know, aspirations are or their goals are for that particular year. So now, you know, what are your purposes of the KPIs? You know, first, they help to trend success of a process, you know, again, to show improvement or regression. 
you know, your KPI gives you a, a quick look to determine, you know, how you're moving, if you're moving the right direction or not. Um, again, are you improving year over year, month over month? Um, and, and am I, am I moving in the right direction? You know, second, your KPIs, you know, should help you to establish a target for your team to strive for. Um, we'll see this later, later as we get into some of the best, best practices around KPIs, but um, each metric and each KPI that you set should at least have some sort of standard that you're trying to meet or you're moving towards, you know, and exactly how close you are to that target. Uh, you know, again, so building from that first idea, yes, we may have improved slightly from, from last month or last year, but are we still reaching that uh, the desired goal or that target that we have set in place? Um, another purpose for your KPIs here is to, you know, help leaders make informed decisions, you know, that are based on data and more objective in nature than, than subjective. You know, revenue cycle leaders face uh, a lot of decisions on, you know, how to determine whether their staff uses their time and their efforts. So using those KPIs can really become, you know, a beneficial, I don't say crutch, but something to lead on in that decision-making process. You know, they give credence and, and kind of support and evidence for those decisions. And finally here, you know, your KPIs help recognize any process breakdowns or opportunities for improvement. Um, I think back to the, the the change healthcare situation earlier in this year uh, that was so prevalent for, for a lot of folks. Um, you know, good KPIs that were in place around potentially claim submission or claim acceptance rates, those may have been your first indication that, that something had gone awry with, with those claims being snapped the door and being accepted or not accepted from change healthcare. So having that KPI in plot, KPI in place around that would be great. And even if you didn't have that and you didn't recognize that immediately, you know, having some sort of metrics or KPIs um, could have been critical in, you know, quantifying how large of a financial impact that that uh, change healthcare situation may have had on your organization. So all good reasons to have KPIs and, and kind of support that reason of, of this purpose of having KPIs in place. So we've, we've talked about kind of the basics of KPIs, what they are, what they're used for. So now we'll kind of get into, you know, how do you develop KPIs if you don't have anything in place? Um, you know, your, your first key piece here, I would say, is, is really defining exactly the metric you're looking to, to monitor and be sure that you're as detailed as possible and exactly how you intend to measure it. You know, you want to be sure that as you report this KPI going forward, you know, you would obtain the information and measure it the exact same way every time. Um, the example we have here is around denials. So if, if you have nothing in place and you come to the determination, you know, I want to put a, a KPI in place around den denials, really your first piece is, okay, define exactly what you mean by that. Are you going to start pulling um, how many denied line items occurred or how many denied invoices occurred or how many denial codes have been posted? You know, each of those metrics can be quote unquote determined as a, a denial count but they would give you three different um, numbers from a month to month basis. So again, are you counting it the same way every time? You know, a, a big part of the success in defining that KPI is making sure you define it to the point where, you know, you can do it the exact same way every single month going forward. You know, you, you want to have it uh, as detailed as possible. So, so again, it, it's, there's, there's no confusion on how that number is pulled, you know, um, again, if you're starting from scratch, you, you think about credit creating these KPIs, maybe you select one to three for each area within your revenue cycle and start there. Again, start small, but try to encompass all those areas within, a, um, within revenue cycle that we saw in that claim life cycle slide a few, a few slides back. Um, again, you, you want it to find those KPIs that align with your organizational goals and that give you the best insight on your team's success from the beginning of that claim life cycle all the way to the end. So again, tracking what matters and being as detailed as possible in defining those KPIs. So if you have no KPIs in place yet, how do you develop, again, those first one to three that we talked about? You know, we'll walk through that same example that we mentioned on the last slide around tracking denials. Um, but the idea is here is that it's starting with something small is better than nothing. You can slowly start building upon that until it meets all of your needs. Um, we have here kind of four, I'd say, arbitrary levels described uh, within within denial um, within this denial KPI. So, you know, if you have nothing around KPIs in regards to denials, maybe your first step is to begin just counting a raw number of denials received monthly. You know, define exactly what we mean by that that raw number. And after several months, at least you have some sort of trend occurring around that, that quantity of denials. Then as you feel comfortable with that, you can build upon that level two, 
maybe you progress to a, a percentage so that volume that you have um, is minimizing that calculation. So 7% of your claims as opposed to 9% of your claims last month were denied, something along those lines. So we're, we're, we're improving and making that KPI metric just a little bit better. But even then, once we have that in place, we can continue to build upon that and work towards what we have here as levels three and four, where you see more actionable data being pulled out and more detailed trends begin to emerge. So the number of monthly prior auth denials for a particular payer or, or something along those lines really give you a, a better indicator of the changes that are occurring. Uh, maybe there's a change in policy by, by Cigna. Maybe there's changes in, in prior author requirements. Maybe your your team, maybe maybe someone's gone on vacation and you missed that, but by really having that detailed analysis, and that detailed metric around that KPI kind of gives you some insight into what's occurring and it helps you make some decisions moving forward. So clean and consistent data, we, we mentioned here, that really helps your KPIs um, by really establishing a point of communication for your teams. You know, you had a metric that's a point in time that you can always refer back to uh, when having those conversations or decisions um, with either your internal team or external teams. Um, th those KPIs also give managers an, an understanding of kind of the why behind the actions. You know, if you see a drop in your cash collections, can you look it back to your KPIs and determine exactly what's occurring that has caused that? Is it caused by an increase in denials or a decrease in the volume of claims submitted or, or maybe more claim acknowledgement rejections, like we mentioned from the, the change healthcare situation. You know, the first step to a solution in a lot of these instances in a revenue cycle is often to understand the issue fully. So use those KPIs to help you to do that. Similarly, you can use those KPIs to encourage team engagement or buy-in. You know, if you're making a, a decision to change someone's workflow or their behavior or exactly what their focus is on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, it's beneficial to have those, that data behind you that supports those changes and that, that, that change in their behavior. You know, again, KPIs help support vision, they provide understanding, and then allow faster for faster course correction. Again, when a metric starts to deteriorate, you can see it quickly, you see the numbers in black and white, and you can make an informed decision on what you need, need to do to change that behavior or pattern to kind of correct that KPI moving forward. So what we, we, we have an example here, it says without consistent KPI data, small problems become bigger problems and can lead to costly situations. Um, the first example I always think of when we see this is kind of your car dashboard. Um, you know, if that check engine light comes on, you, you probably want to at least take a look, maybe maybe throw some coolant in it or something before that, that temperature gauge, you know, go, goes through the roof. You know, maybe all you need to do, again, is, is a small fix, but if you don't do anything, the entire engine blows up, and then you've got a major, major problem on your hands. You know, so things like, you know, lack of team engagement or inconsistent data, those types of situations balloon to a larger issue if they're not recognized quickly and they're not addressed. So again, use those KPIs to help identify those problems before they become a larger, you know, more considerable issue. Um, you know, when we we discuss KPIs um, in regard to things like employee engagement, um, one of the things that comes to mind really is, is kind of to help those frontline employees uh, make that connection between their work and the bottom line. You know, as employees kind of work on their, their things from a day-to-day -day basis, you know, often there's, there's a, there's a tendency to kind of disconnect themselves from that day-to-day -day work and become a little detached from the bigger picture. So I always like to kind of refer back to those KPIs and say, okay, this is the impact that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, what you've done here is in improving this number or this metric, and we're seeing the, the benefits of your work and really to not reward individuals for their efforts, but to make sure that they recognize that what they're doing um, does impact those financials and that bottom line to the best of their abilities. So we have we have a slide here that says when effective KPIs are present, action happens. I, I would really say that when effective KPIs are kind of embraced by the team, that's when the actions happen. So uh, again, think of these items here. It, it's kind of a roadmap. You know, when you have established and effective KPIs present, um, you know, everyone has the same version of truth. They have the same roadmap. They see where they've been, where we're going, you know, and, and exactly what needs to be be focused on and what is the high level items that, that everyone needs to be focused on. Um, again, item problems can be identified more quickly when those, those metrics are in black and white. And, and, and utilization and, and throughput can be assessed by basically just looking at the, again, the raw numbers, using that, that data to help make your informed decisions. Um, so again, following this roadmap, 
creates an environment that's kind of built on data and analytics. Um, I, I would say this, the, the fourth bullet point here is really important though, is if you're going to build that environment that's built on, on data and you're very an analytically based, uh, the focus really needs to be on addressing the plot problems and not nitpicking the data. So again, if there's any errors in reporting or doubts around the accuracy of that information, it really kind of hamstrings the whole KPI process and, and creating that, that potential um, idea of data-driven environment. But once that, that data it can be agreed upon, everyone feels like we're confident in it, that's when those positive actions begin and that greater efficiency and engagement occurs. So we, we've kind of walked through a lot of the, the, the pieces that get to this point, but now we'll kind of look at an example of a KPI dashboard. Um, this one here is fairly basic, generated in Excel, um, but from this example, we do have a couple of major points that kind of jump out. Um, number one, in that first column there, we do have the KPI that is listed. Normally when I would create something like this right next to it, maybe in the comments, somewhere along those lines is you know exactly where this information is being pulled and how the data is obtained. Um, you know, it may be as detailed as the billing manager pulls this report on this day um, after close and reports the total found at the bottom of page X. You know, really get to that that you know that level of detail. Um, kind of documenting all those questions. If you go back to to elementary school, you know, the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why uh, of how this number, how this metric is generated. Um, the second item that we see here in the dashboard is that each metric has a goal. So we, we have a documented target to shoot for for each of these. Um, those goals may change over time, but at least we know what we're aiming for. You know, if your DSO is 80 today, maybe your goal isn't going to be 40 next month, but we start slowly and say, okay, our, our, our intermediate goal is 60 days. And once you hit that, then we adjust that goal down to that 40 or 45 day goal. But again, each of the metrics that we have here does have a goal in place so that everyone knows exactly what the target is that we're reaching for. And then, then finally, the third piece that we have that's, I'd say, more nice to have and not a requirement is that color indicator, that red, yellow, green. You know, how are we doing? Are we meeting that goal? Are we approaching it but not quite there? Or are we a little ways off and we still have a lot of work to do? Um, I, I would say that red, yellow, green doesn't simplify the process, but it does at least give a, a quick visual representation of kind of where we're at. Um, and along those lines, I'd even say that you know, having something in red doesn't mean that someone's not doing a good job or they're not trying. Um, maybe you just have a broken process. You know, so look at those those, those red quote unquote indicators as an opportunity to reevaluate the workflow um, and, and reassess exactly what's occurring, and not take that as a quick um, jump to conclusion that whoever's working on that that particular piece is is just not doing their job as um, to the best of their abilities. So as we think to kind of about the reports in place to monitor RCM key indicators, what we're really talking about is those, again, involved in that clean life cycle that we saw in one of those first slides. Um, these are the, the process measures to help explain how the clinic or the AR is doing and performing. Um, these are normally separate from those in place for the finance, you know, the general ledger, the P&L, things of that nature. But again, we have these two arrows here. They are connected and they do have an impact on each other. So you see that they're tied together and, and really, although they're pointing in opposite directions, they do, again, have an impact on each other. So when you're setting those KPIs, consider those things that, that may translate over to your GNL and the, and the PNL, um, your, your general ledger or the PNL. Things like you know, your write-offs, bad debt, things of that nature that once those things occur and do you have a metric in place uh, on the revenue cycle side and how does those things impact those financial measures moving forward? So, have here is just some examples of some of those reports we have to monitor revenue cycle financial health. Um, again, these on this slide are pre-claimed at the front end. So what do we have in place and what can we measure and track from the time that we, we enter that charge, we try to submit it through the, the payer and is it accepted or not? So did we register everyone correctly? Did we get the, clean, the, the claim clean enough to get through the door? Are we collecting those point of service collections on the front end? And then again, did the payer accept that claim and those things of that nature? So as we look at these examples here, these are those, those pre-claim um, reports that we would use to identify and track those KPIs of whether or not that claim was accepted by the payer. On the next slide, Amy, what we have is, is kind of more so the back end piece of those KPIs. So these are those from transaction processing and AR management. So now we've submitted the claim. Now we're looking at monitoring how well and how successful we're doing in um, appealing, following up, following up on denials, things of that nature. So 
uh, gross days in AR. That's more of a holistic approach of that whole entire AR. But yeah, again, how much of our AR is over 90 days? Are we tracking that and seeing any of those trending there? Um, and again, bad debt, charity, denial, those type of things that would have an impact on those financial reports, all good to be reviewing and identifying on that KPI perspective on the back end of, of your KPIs. Um, what we have here is primarily calculations around some of those financial measures. So we won't through walk, walk through every single one of these, but just to be aware of there is some sort of, I might say, quote unquote, standard on how most of these um, financial measures and calculations are reported. But even within these, just be aware that there is some variation um, that may occur. Um, days in AR, for example, most calculations may use a kind of a 90-day rolling time frame to make that determination, but uh, I've seen them use 60, 120, 180 days. So just be aware that there is some variation. And, and once you make that determination of exactly how you're going to make that calculation, stick to that calculation and that determination going forward so there's not variation in your, in your reporting. And then what we have here is a uh, we skipped over. Yeah, I did. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, HFMA, just so you're aware, has created a, a map key initiative to assist in KPIs. Um, the, the map keys are in five major categories. So there's patient access, pre-billing, claims, account resolution, and financial management. Um, the map terminology is a three-letter acronym for measure, apply, and perform. And we have provided the link around that standard and those benchmarks. So there's some opportunities within that map initiative for you know, peer comparison, benchmarking, and some other items as well. So just be aware that that's out there through HFMA um, if you'd like to kind of see that that benchmarking and, and be able to see that peer-to-peer -peer -peer review. And I would say also, Ryan, on that note, you know, the map keys do um, the ones that you shared on that example of a key indicator report that you were tracking, those are the those are the metrics that we've listed there that are related to rural health care. Um, with HFMA, it is industry wide, and so it's larger organizations that may impact it. So, yep. So I, I'm like, I, I'm, this is my slide. So welcome to <laughs> um, just talking about the key indicator best practices. You know, you really want to make sure that you are developing an environment that is data driven. And one of the ways to do that is by holding revenue cycle team meetings to monitor and track the results. You know, look. If, with your team, if you're just starting out with this, you want to have indicators that are actionable and you're benchmarking against those industry standards and then trend it over time. It could be that when you look at it compared to industry standards, the industry standard may be a 40-day AR and you're sitting at like a 70-day AR. And that might not be the best standard to look against, but maybe looking, you know, setting a standard of, say, if you're at 70, going to 60 days AR and reaching that goal and then modifying it to get to that industry standard. But just really looking at ways to drive that improvement and looking at it from an overall perspective. Some other things to make sure that when you're doing these best practices, Ryan provided a list of reports that were out there and then also here the calculation. But what you wanna make sure that you're doing is you're tracking who and when and how that data is obtained. Like employee X pulls metric Y from this report Z at time B. You know, are you creating that reporting cadence. You know, is it done on a daily basis, a weekly basis, monthly, quarterly, annually? Um, realizing that there are some metrics, that is some reports that cannot be re reproduced. It could be that it can't be reproduced based on the way that your system holds that data or also things like unapplied cash. That once the payment posters get in there, they start applying the cash and it's no longer unapplied. So you really want to make sure that you know who is pulling the information, that, what that cadence is for pulling it, and that you stick to that cadence and keeping that information going along. When looking at KPIs, you want to use it to spot trends and anomalies out there. And some of the ways to do it are to look at it current period to prior period, current period to your prior year, or current period to the prior year in. What's going on? You know, because if you look at this example, if I had looked at cash collections for just current period to the prior period, I see that it's gone down 15%. And I'm like, oh, and I started doing a firefight. But when I go and look at it 
related to last year or the current year end, you see that it's really not bad after all, that maybe it's dipping down from the prior month. But when I look at last year or the current, the prior year end, those numbers didn't fluctuate. And you could see that we had great activities going on. So when looking at that, making sure that you're comparing it over time, one thing that I've always heard uh, when analyzing numbers is a current period does not a trend make. So you really want to make sure that you're looking at it and understanding what's happening. And then really when, when the, you know, that current period does not a trend make, really making sure that you're investigating, asking questions, you know, who, what, when, where, why. It's the things that we heard when we were in elementary school. But one of the things that we hear in a Six Sigma environment is asking why three times, just asking, why did this happen? And when they say that, then why is going on? Because it could be that, you know what, the first answer isn't always the only answer that's out there. There are multiple factors that are in play, especially in revenue cycle. And so the first answer may not be the only answer to your question. And then looking at the information differently. Instead of just looking at a period to period, looking, is there a specific payer that's standing out? Is this an annual trend? And then also, don't just focus on financial areas. Look at the entire process. Has there been an operational change that is causing this to happen? It's like, has there been turnover in, in your leadership of, say, your clinic? And with that turnover of the leadership, certain processes are no longer being done and no one was trained to do that work. So those are things that you want to look at and pay attention to. And then really you've got, if you use an outside vendor, we may be talking about KPIs, but you really wanna make sure that you are holding the vendor accountable for it, that they are exceeding, you know, there's an expected service level, what the timelines for those deliverables are, you know, helping them help you be a more successful organization, but then you helping them have a, have a more successful relationship and, and enhancing that accountability and, you know, where everyone, everything should fall out related to these key indicators. You know, and also a final thing that's out there is just related to contracting. When you have payer contracting, people are asking me, Amy, what do I do about these payer contracts? You can use it within payer contracting to track denials, medical necessity, you know, overall success and financial health of that payer. What does that information look like? And tracking that and then having the discussions with them to hold them accountable for the results. Things that um, we can talk about too are reusing your KPIs to develop a daily rate on, you know, what is your volume that comes through? Is it normal? When we had the clearinghouse issues with Change Healthcare, you had things where claims were being submitted, but they weren't being accepted. And you could track that volume growing through just looking at your KPI and taking it down to a daily rate. So with that, we are at the end of our time and just want to be respectful of that. We appreciate the time you've given us. We've got our contact information here. And if anybody has any questions that they want to quickly put into the chat, we'd be happy to address that. And I just want to say thank you, you know, for your, oh, Hillary, did one show up? I do have one actually. Um, I have a question from Bill. He would like to know um, how do I know if I have the right KPIs in place or if I'm missing something critical? We always seem to find things that are falling through the cracks. So, Ryan, you want to take you know, since you were talking about developing those? Yeah, I think the first thing I would do is maybe one go back to the um, the slide that Amy said showed at the beginning, kind of that revenue cycle. Uh, claim life cycle and, and really look through the 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 pieces of that and say, okay, in my mind, what would indicate success in each of those areas? You know, how would I know if I'm doing well from a registration perspective? And how would I know if I'm doing well from a claim acceptance or claim submission perspective? And really define what what success would look like and then start, okay, what KPIs can I put in place or do I have in place that helps to monitor those, those areas? Um, and once you kind of have that in mind, go to those 
those KPIs that are set in place by HFMA or kind of those benchmarking KPIs and begin to build upon some of those in each of those areas that makes the most sense that works with your workflow um, to, to cover all, all of your bases, so to speak. You know, too many, you can get to be, have too many KPIs, but really maybe again, three to five ish for each of those areas to cover those, those major areas and kind of work from there. Hey, thanks for that, Ryan. And then just because I know that we are at the top of the hour, if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot them to us through our contact information that's there. And then also knowing that when you sign out of this conference today, we do appreciate the time that you've given to us um, in just in investing in yourself. In, and we are committed to pro providing high quality learning events. So you'll see a survey pop up and we just appreciate your feedback and anything that we can do to provide um, quality learning opportunities for you. And with that, I will say thank you very much and um, look forward to other times to get to speak with you. Thank you so much, Amy and Ryan and everyone who presented today and everyone who joined us um, for this conference. Thank you for participating and uh, we hope that you learned something that will help you going forward. <laughs>